Hello and welcome to episode 90, part one and only for December 2019. We're merging the astronomy and space exploration this month. We welcomed in 2019 with the real possibility that Jeff Bezos' sexting antics could lead to pictures of his Johnson being leaked all over social media and the tabloids. And we end 2019 with the very real possibility that he'll build the lunar lander that puts humans back on the moon. How well 2019 panned out for him. At the beginning of the year, Elon Musk was accusing a diver of being a pedo for offering to help rescue a trapped Thai school football team. And by the end of 2019, the ensuing defamation case revealed Musk paid $52,000 to a con man to spread a malicious, false and anonymous leak campaign against the said diver. So not quite as much redemption for Musk this year. But here on The Good Ship Awesome, we cast away the frivolous. We don't cover news of Musk calling a good Samaritan a pedo guy. No, we focus on his exploding rockets. <laughs> we cast scorn on the reporting of the Amazon founder's dick pics. Instead, Jenny goes on a Twitter tirade against him for leaving Amazon deliveries in a food waste bin. Oh, no, but who does that? Who does that? <laughs> and that's not a euphemism, guys. Bad Bezos. Right in a bin. <laughs> So here we are in the final throws of 2019 and the 20 teens, or whatever we called this decade. No one was really sure. So we're kicking the arse out of this decade and preparing for the next roaring 20s, hopefully with less misogyny, fascism, preventable diseases and economic catastrophe. But you can never be sure. They're all de rigueur again. I'm Ralph, your host for this month, and joining me to take the edge off a f***ing horrible world by focusing on this month's scientific advances and the night sky treasures over our heads are the lady still picking bits of banana skin out of her Christmas gifts, Jenny. <laughs> Hiya! And the man who still uses a typewriter for sexed messages and hand delivers classy lithographs of his penis, Paul. Well, would you like it in 3D? Or would you like it... <laughs> Would you like it with the uh, the optional touchy feely? Uh, I'm not going any further with that, really. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Pictures through a zoetrope, please. <laughs> well, I don't know about you guys, but for me, the real highlight has been the new documentary that's come out about our first uh, evasion attempts back in the Edwardian period with the uh, the BBCs, and I assume it's on BBC America and BBC Australia, if such a thing exists, and wherever else in the world everybody's listening from. But the uh, the new War of the Worlds mm. uh, drama, has anyone been watching that? No. I've seen episode one. Good, wasn't it? It was. I, I, I mean, I've heard less good reports of, of, of later on. Oh dear, I've not seen the second one yet, but yeah, the first one. The first one? I really, uh, yeah, good. Good. Nice that they've gone back to the original era. Well, well, it's a bit late, about ten years later than the original. I say it's, a bit, it's book, afterwards, but... isn't it? Because it's Edwardian, whereas actually it was yeah. Victorian was the original. Yeah, so they pitched it at kind of like the real hub- hubris point of just before the uh, yeah, you know yeah, the, yeah. the real peak of uh, British imperialism and British arrogance. I can't help but feel they were influenced by that. Um, have you ever seen that fantastic video? Um, it's on YouTube. I forget what it's called. Of, of a guy who's taken old World War One yes. footage and put this Martian invasion on top of it with like a dubstep soundtrack, isn't it? Yeah, and it's awesome. It is it, so good. I, I it, think I've tweeted it quite a few times. Actually. Yeah, it's brilliant. I can't help but there was like a bit of a, a kind of feel of that. That that's yeah. the, if you set it a little bit later, you can you can give it that kind of feel. Yeah, it was, the, it was the tripods over the trenches, wasn't it, in World yeah, War One? that yeah, one? Yeah, 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 yeah that yeah. was good. But I think they've done a really good job of this. I mean, I was fully expecting it to be absolutely dreadful, but uh, so far, really enjoying it. I think it's a really good drama. Mm. Well, the, the the problem you've got is it's it's one of the greatest science fiction stories ever written. Yeah, possibly the first ever science fiction. First, yeah, the first proper... Well, certainly kind Alien of, Invasion one, yeah. Yeah, first proper... Well, it, it comes in the invasion invasion literature of the late late 19th century, if we want to get into our... Fin de siècle literature. Yes, if we want to get into our literary, literary um, discussion. Um, but um, it's the first kind of proper, really modern science fiction, or one of a group of really sort of modern science fictions. Mm. Um, but they've... There's never really been a brilliant screen adaptation of it. No, I no. mean, there's they, sort of cult classic, you know, like the original, the old '50s film, and all the rest of it, which yeah. are, uh, but it's nothing like the story. It's not. No, it's, it's not good enough. Doesn't and even really, have tripods. Yeah, the, <laughs> seriously, the only. Um, oh, they do have. They are tripods, by the way, in that film. Little known fact: they've got Just invisible, floating tripods. They've got invisible legs. Right. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> that's what the three. If you look at the ships, that's what the three 
glowing lights on the bottom are supposed to be their invisible legs. Oh, because they didn't. Was it because they didn't have the? They yeah, weren't exactly. able to, to to do it properly. With they didn't have any yeah. CGI and they didn't perhaps have the money to to do it properly. Exactly. It's the same as coconuts in Monty Python. <laughs> yes. I actually quite like those because those those are some of the best scary sort of alien ships. Yeah. Um, from that that fifties film, right? they're brilliant actually. They're really really good, but the the clearly the only decent adaptation of it ever has been the Jeff Wayne musical in the seventies yeah. mm. and the artwork. Yeah, and the artwork on the album. With that. Yeah, but we've we've never had a decent film, TV series, anything like that. It just hasn't happened. So uh, mm. so far, episode one, I'm liking it. The only problem is for me that. When you've heard the Jeff Wayne version oh, of War yeah. of the Worlds, you can't hear the opening paragraphs to um, H.G. Yeah. Wells' War of the Worlds other than in Richard Burton's voice. Yeah, you need <laughs> Richard and, Burton. And nobody and, can do it with gravitas like Richard Burton. And especially if you're going to change it very slightly as well, it just seems wrong because yeah. you want to hear it in that deep Welsh voice. And and you can't... And, and those first opening bars, the dun, dun, dun. It's like, it just needs that. It's, just, it's, it's like no other soundtrack could, can possibly go with... with. Yeah. Why is there no prog rock in this? Why, why is there no prog Where's David Essex? I demand <laughs> David Essex. I'm Phil Linnett. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and randomly, the, uh, the, the, the priest needs to be a um, sort of American evangelist. Yes. Yeah, you know, which he is in the musical for some reason. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I, it's, and it's so far so good. But I, I say, yeah, I've got to, I've got to see, see more of it. And yeah. I've heard less good reports. And I know the Twitter sphere was all sort of, ah, oh, this is terrible. When the second one came out, I was like, mm. oh, do I want to watch it now? That's that's just, it was good. But of course, as we'll come on to later on, uh, when we uh, talk about, well, when we come to the debate section, which is now a defunct debate section, mm. Um, mm. the only the, the only opinion that matters is yours, dear listener. So let us know what you think about it. And, um, yeah. And we'll... We'd love to to know what you think about that drama, but um, from the sublime to the ridiculous, um, did anybody uh, catch the, uh, the 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 cloudscape that was Mercury Transit for many of us? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Watched it for about an hour and a half. Mm. It's more than enough. Yeah, it's, it's it's more enough to see a small dot going across a big white dot. So it was more yeah. than just clouds. Then you actually got to see the uh, the transit. Yeah, it was in and out. Hmm. You know, it was sort of look at it for a minute or wait a bit or it's back out or it's gone again. Uh, But yeah, no, I saw it. Yeah. Um, I set up outside the office um, with the Coronado that we've got. Oh. And I sent an email around saying, oh, hey, you know, members of staff, I have my solar scope, come and have a look. And surprise, surprise, hardly any of them turned up. Not like they're astronomers or anything. I know. Which, which one of you guys was it that was saying on, on Twitter something about can you actually be an astronomer if you don't look through a telescope? Oh, yeah, that was me. I had a little bit of a rant on Twitter. <laughs> and I, uh, but but that's, that's, that's the point in question. It's If you can't even be bothered as an academic in astronomy or astrophysics to look through a telescope when you've got something like the transit of Mercury mm. or you've got an eclipse or just something that's kind of like, you know, a, a real wow phenomenon. Yeah. It's pretty especially poor showing, if the telescope, it? yeah, if, especially if the telescope is set up and all you have to do is wander over and put your eye up to it. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. you don't. All the hard work's been done for you. I, I had, all the lugging of equipment's been done, but no. I, I had a crazy afternoon for that because I did that stupid thing where I knew it was there, and I kind of made a note of it. Like, oh, transit with Mercury, yeah, that's good. Right, must must make sure. Because I'm in control of my own diary. So yeah. I was like, you know, must make sure I don't. And then someone emailed me about a school that wanted... I went, yeah, 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 I can do that that afternoon. Put it in, confirmed it. And then it was sort of later that evening, a few weeks before, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> that was the transit of Mercury. I've just booked a school over the top of it. <laughs> oh, man. And and I, I will be... The, I was the one hoping it would be cloudy. Then all the time up to that, I was like, I hope it's cloudy now because I'm going to really hate myself for doing this. But And was it where you were? Where we were, it wasn't. It was really nice. A bit windy. Uh, So what I did is I threw my frack and a filter in the the boot of the car with all my other gubbins for work and just sort of set it all up. 
steamed down to the other end of Wiltshire, did this school, and thought, oh, maybe I can set up in the playground at the end of the, the thing and, you know, show the kids. No, this school was on the reverse side of a hill where you couldn't see the sun. <laughs> oh. Oh, no. So, finished this, this, this workshop I was doing all afternoon, started driving away from the school, like mad over this hill, and down near the Salisbury Plain, I'm like, basically like mad trying to find a place where I can pull up in the car set up the scope safely and it's got a decent view of the sun and at the corner of my eye I can see there's a bit of clouds coming as well um, oh no I was like just crazy driving across thinking like there better not be a police officer because I'm ah! <laughs> and, it, like, and, and it was one of those moments this was just like um, the eclipse we saw Ralph yeah where we were just racing down the M4 trying to find somewhere. Yeah. And actually, we don't even know where we were when we pulled up, did we? No, we had no idea. We had no idea. It just happened to be outside of school, which was great, because it meant that yeah. the kids then came out and took a look through the scopes. And it was exactly the same thing. I just, I basically just steamed down. It like, just kept going, right, I'll go left here. I'll go right here. There must be something. Must be. I'm looking at the, the, the map on the car going like, there's a village up ahead. There must be a green or something. And then just found this random little sports field next, near this village. I have no idea what it was called. I still don't know. I still haven't looked. And just sort of <laughs> popped up the scope and just went, ah, there. And then saw it. Uh, and I used a new, um, the, the little Celestron adapter for your phone. They've got a new adapter that can take any phone. Oh, right. Oh, that's good. And it's brilliant. It's Is really it? good. Is it good? It's really, really good. It's really steady. It's really sturdy bit of kit. And it works really, really well. I used it just a few days before I went up to Manchester to do a, um, a print the moon thing with an art group uh, that I, I work with hmm. uh, and we used it people put their phones in and took pictures of the moon and it's brilliant because it, 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 it just really really good images and you can you can then use the scope to actually like zoom in and, and actually use your phone to zoom in properly and, and get some really good images mm. oh that's great I remember when we were doing our sidewalk astronomy stuff and mm. the, the amount of people that wanted to be able to get a picture on their phone of mm. and this was before you know you had these kind of means of being able to you know you had to use your hands to to get mm. it steady and take a picture yeah. through the eyepiece so being able to do something like that so that people can actually take pictures is probably a great thing for oh. other people that are listening to this that do sidewalk astronomy and try and engage it, particularly kids yeah. and and it's, and, and it's celestial phone of the public. adapter uh, and we actually at that manchester thing in the middle of manchester big city loads of lights we imaged with a phone um m45 whoa wow. and then even better we then put the, that, using the, a, a special thing because this, this group has, on a Polaroid. We put M45 onto a Polaroid. That's cool. <laughs> Which was actually just that's one of those moments like, that's quite cool. That's actually really cool. We've just put M45 onto a Polaroid film. That's really cool. Um, so, yeah, but, yeah, I used it for the Mercury Transit. So I've got loads of pictures and, and, and watched it. It was great, but, it, yeah, it was one of those really mad dashes. It was actually quite good fun, but yeah. there was a moment. I was like, oh, I'm not going to see this. I'm just going to keep driving forever just trying to find that place. <laughs> and, no, and then the clouds are coming. I'll be like, fuck. <laughs> but it's and, good. And next month, Jan, you've got Jan. Next month, uh, which will be Jan, <laughs> Jen. <laughs> yeah, you've got uh, a talk at an astronomical society in Wales, haven't you? I do. I'm talking at Barry and going back home woohoo that's your local astronomical yeah I didn't even know though. that Barry had an astronomical society oh right truth be told I don't know whether it's a modern thing and if anybody wants to go what's Barry's surname so they can get in touch with him to find out about <laughs> it oh, oh very funny wah, Barry wah, Island wah, 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 wah. Uh, I'll be here till Thursday, try the veal Although, (laughs) as we're talking about this I just realised that I've signed myself up To do a talk and some astronomy At um, Howell's Girls School In uh, In Penarth, and that's also in January And I can't remember what the day is that I'm speaking In Barry So that could be a fun day for me You've just double booked (laughs) (laughs) I know I'm going to have to I might Uh while we're recording, have a little uh, a little Google as to when I'm supposed to be uh, speaking at Barry Astronomical Society. <laughs> so, update on my paper. Oh, yes. Da, 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 da. I have a reviewer assigned. Mm. I don't have a report yet. Mm. That's it. That's my update on my, on my old project. Uh, but my new project is um, I'm looking at... So, there was... It was in the news recently... Um, the illustrious TNG, which stands for Next Gen, the Next Generation, um, did a press release for their TNG fifty, which is the most detailed simulation of the universe ever. 
there are the the illustrious TNGs are um are you ready for some jargon? Uh cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. Ooh. Yeah, I know, right? Wow. I, that requires some explanation. I know, yeah. Explanation which I do not have as of yet because even I don't I don't fully understand <laughs> how they work. Um but they're the most complex and sort of most up to date simulations of the universe and galaxies that we have. Uh, what they basically do is they start um, as close to the Big Bang as the physics that we currently have will let them, and um, they evolve mm-hmm. um, the sort of seeds of galaxies all the way through the universe until the present day, um, using you know all the physics that they can possibly chuck into it, that the computers will sort of let them process without breaking the computers you know these simulations take months and months to run on you know banks of supercomputers so they're really really powerful which given that the universe is 13.78 billion years old that's not bad no it's pretty good right yeah that's pretty good so there's three different resolutions there's 300 150 and that just refers to the size of the the cube box that the universe is sort of scaled to and then so the bigger the box the less resolution you have so the less fine detail that you can see uh, so the tng 50 is super high resolution so it's better for sort of studying the universe on a galaxy by galaxy basis um whereas like the 300 one is better for grand sort of cosmological studies and the one that i use which is the tng 100 is kind of sits somewhere in between Mm-hmm. But yeah, I just thought it was quite timely that I've started working on this stuff, and the TNG fifty is just in the big press release, and cool. uh, yeah, so it's yeah, it's fun, and uh, yeah, like, and we're throwing out the twenty teens, and it's the twenty twenties, and you're starting on a new project, a groundbreaking project. Although, though, though, Pro- yeah. though, can I can I put push my glasses up my nose that I don't own oh, and say no, I'm going to yeah. say it's not the end yeah. of the decade. Right, you keep um, saying this, and I don't understand why it isn't. Because how can you not understand? Be there is no year zero, therefore the ten is the end of the decade. But when we start, when we got to year two thousand, it was a new millennium. <laughs> yes, exactly. It goes from one BCE to one CE, and therefore. Yeah. But when we got to 10, the year 2000, yes. it was a new millennium. So why would you have a new millennium but not a new decade? That was actually bo- It actually starts 2001. Which, by the way, is why Arthur C. Clarke set the book in 2001. Because it was the start of a new millennia. Because he understood it. So, Paul, what you what you failed to do there is say, I, I think, think you'll, you'll find, find, that, I think that, you'll that, find. that 1970 was actually in the 60s. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, essentially, from a historian's point of view, it was. Yes, but it makes no sense semantically. <sighs> so, yeah, it's bollocks. a new decade. I, I'm going to. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to be like the Swiss. The Swiss didn't celebrate the new millennium into 2001 because the Swiss were right. <laughs> this is why people hate yeah. scientists. <laughs> Hey, I I think it's a new cen- a new century. I don't think it's a new century. I think it's a Jesus. new decade. <laughs> Let's put it to you, listener. What do you think? Are you a pedant or are you going to go with naming conventions? I, look, I'm, I'm actually doing this with my historian's hat on. Right? There's no year zero. It can't be a new decade. Otherwise, yeah. Oh, f- to you. <laughs> so the the millennium bug happened in the 1900s. Then, as far as you're concerned, yeah. It never happened. As far as I'm concerned, it, it never happened. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, it and, <laughs> and from what I, what I hear, it was very easy, which is why Brexit's going to be very easy, because that's the argument I hear all the time. Well, the million bucks, they just blew that out of the water, didn't they? That, that was just like, you know, that was nothing. <laughs> Can we just get it done It'll and then fine. everything will be fine? <laughs> It'll be fine. It's just like the Millennium Bug. <laughs> Let's not go oh. down that rabbit hole. Right, okay. <laughs> Moving on. Geronimo. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I just wanted to read out a couple of emails. The first one is a a rather important one, actually. It's from our good friend Mm Brioni Tilsley at the Dartmoor Skies Charity, who uh, provide access to a telescope, and they give talks to the public uh, in the Dartmoor National Park. And Brioni says, Hi, Awesome Astronomy crew. We set up Dartmoor Skies over four years ago, and we've been surprised and pretty chuffed by the response it's had. As you guys know, most people love stargazing and astronomy on some level and really appreciate a welcoming environment where they can learn more. 
In the past, we've donated our own telescope and used our own funds to buy equipment, but we're now in need of a telescope upgrade. Our current scope is falling apart and we don't know how much longer it can hold out. And as great as our main telescope is, there are still many astronomical objects that it can't see. So we're using this as an opportunity to up our game and make stargazing even more awesome for people. We mostly work with an 8-inch DOB, but we're aiming to get a 16-inch Explore Scientific Ultra Portable. This purchase is going to be a big one. In total, we need £2,650. That's about three, $3,200 to get the telescope plus all the extra equipment. We need to make the most of the kit. A new eyepiece, shroud, ladder, etc. But our initial goal is 2225 so roughly $3,000, which will get us the telescope. As events make up our main source of funding, we're stuck if we don't have a working telescope. We need to ensure Dartmoor Skies keep on offering those important opportunities for all the communities in the southwest of England. So, if you're in the southwest of England, or just a wealthy philanthropist who wants to make a big difference to local astronomy education and inspiration, for what relatively is only a small sum of money, please do consider heading over to www.crowdfunder.co.uk slash skies hyphen morescope that's M-O-O-R-S-C-O-P-E or dartmoorskies.org and, um, and go and help them to continue bringing awesome astronomy to uh, people out there in, in Dartmoor, and, which is a national dark sky reserve. And just to add to that, um, when this goes out, they're about 12 days from left of that, that fundraiser and they've already got over half the amount. Oh, so excellent. if people that is really good people see. throw the money in and get the get into that that'd be really great because we you know, enough awesome yeah. listeners chucking in 10 quid 10 dollars whatever will get that over that that mark very quickly and if you were uh, if you're a, a budding elon musk out there that's got more money than sense rather than putting satellites up that will ruin the night sky <laughs> maybe you could just throw them throw them a few coins that'll help them well get over that mark and, um, and actually bring proper astronomy and, and the ones of the night sky. Uh, next up, our good friend, I'm, I'm only mentioning this one because I think it's quite funny, actually. Our good friend, I think it's Euron, Euron Stolt, says, Hi, Martians and Jen. What do you think of this new in-space propulsion concept of NASA? It sounds fishy to me. Love the show. Regards, Euron Stolt in the Netherlands. And the reason it's funny is because he, the URL he sent didn't work, and it's something that we'd love to talk about, because <laughs> I love all this kind of futuristic science coming out of NASA, but the UR, URL didn't work. So can you send it again, please? I want to, I want <laughs> you to, want to know. I want to talk want about to it. I can't be bothered to, to send an email. I'm guessing it's the, it's the um, electric propulsion thingy that we may have talked about before. It, 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 it was doing the rounds on social media again recently. We, we talked about it oh, probably about two, three years ago. Well, if you could send that back into us, we'll we'll take a look at it and either rehash an article from a couple of years ago, or um, or we'll be able, it'll be something new that we can uh, discuss and and think about the endless possibilities of sailing off, off to new solar systems, star systems. So, we now move on to the part of the show that we have no control over, the news. Well, we do have a bit of control over it. Paul can choose not to discuss the meteor that took out Iceland last week, and Jen could ignore that momentous landing of aliens on Earth. We'll just have to wait and see. Jen, what have you got for us this month? So this month, I am starting out close to home and then moving out through the universe. So we're going to begin in our solar Mm -hmm. system with the discovery of, get this water vapor geysers on Europa. Well, uh, (laughs) maybe, anyway. Never once to shy away from the spectacular, NASA are at it again with a whirlwind headline and a warm puddle of a story. Since 2013, images from HST have teased at plumes spewing from the surface of the Galilean moon, and other Hubble observations have indicated that the presence of molecules that form from UV light breaking apart water, but the results have been all too tenuous for anything concrete. Europa almost definitely has a subsurface ocean, but the question here is, does it erupt from the surface in huge plumes? So during 2016 and 2017, Keck turned his attention to um, the icy moon 17 times. And 16 of those times, it saw nothing. 
zip, nada, no water. But one time, it did. And the detected infrared radiation indicated that over 2,000 tonnes of water had been ejected into space. Now, is this enough to say that the geysers definitely exist on Europa? Well, according to NASA it is. They argue maybe the eruptions on Europa are much less frequent than those on Enceladus, the plume-rich moon of Saturn. And there is some evidence to suggest that that is the case. But, well, one out of 17 observations finding something, I'm going to let you guys be the judge. I mean, the ultimate answer is going to come in the next decade uh, with Europa Clipper. Um, But until then, we're going to kind of have to just keep squinting and hope for the best. Staying in the solar system with the next story, we've got the renaming of 2014 MU69, temporarily known as Ultima Thule, the most distant object in the solar system to ever be explored. You know, it's the one that New Horizons went to that looks a bit like a snowman or a shelled peanut. It's now officially known as Arakoth, which means sky in Powhatan or Algonquin. So they didn't go with a Nazi name then? They decided against the Nazi name in the end, funnily enough. Yeah, uh, I wonder why. <laughs> mm, can't recall any reasons. Can't imagine. Next, I have to talk about the blob in the great sort of theme of ancient science fiction. But I'm not actually talking about the 1958 cinematic Marvel or the 1988 remake This blob is a bit further from home and may answer a question that has remained unsolved since, well, funnily enough, uh, since around the time of the remake of the blob. In 1987, a giant explosion occurred in the Large Magellanic Cloud, one of the small satellite galaxies of our own Milky Way. And this was the brightest and closest supernova for about 400 years. And it was named, rather whimsically for astronomers, Supernova 1987A. Aren't we imaginative? Now, since then, the supernova has been monitored and studied at all different wavelengths, and um, its proximity makes it the perfect laboratory for us to understand these enigmatic phenomena. Um, Whilst this answered many questions and taught us a lot about supernovae, one question has remained about this one in particular. What happened to the star after it exploded? Well, an international team led by Phil Seagan of Cardiff University, and not just of Cardiff University, but he's on the team that I work with at the university, so this is great fun for me. Uh, While Phil may have found the answer, uh, Phil and the others that worked on this project found a blob of gas and dust glowing twice as brightly as the dust around it in the middle of the supernova remnant. And this mysterious glow is probably because it's hiding a really powerful energy source, a neutron star. It's the first time that anyone's been able to take a good guess at what happened to the star after the explosion. And time will tell if they are right about 1987A. Um, In about 50 years or so, the gas and dust in the middle should have cleared enough to reveal what is currently hidden. Oh, that's going to be great. Dun, 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 dun. It's good, isn't it? And then it'll just like a little curtain will go ching. And I'm I'm imagining like Monty Python esque little cartoon, little little, little sort of curtain. Little cartoon curtain will sort of reveal and unveiling it, and that there'll be like a you know a massive penis or something. <laughs> 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 it is actually gibbous crabs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. I remember 1987A happening. Oh wow, you are old. Oh, sh- f- off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, but it was just at the point when I was really, really starting to get interested in astronomy and things. Uh, so, as a, as a kid, and I remember it happening. So I remember um, Patrick Moore. He got on the like the first flight out to I think it was Australia or whatever. He 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 rushed off to go and see, it, and that was a big sky at night thing at the time. Um, it feels like a very long time ago, but that's cool. That's because it was a very long time oh, ago. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Right, I'm going to move on to my final story. Um, And this is that the universe may now seem a little less empty, with evidence potentially confirming the existence of a new particle, (gasps) the axion. Which, by the way, is the best particle name. 
like the axion. I love yeah, it. Good. Now, axions may be the particles that make up dark matter because they really interact with normal matter. And so they kind of fit the bill. Now, someone is muttering something as I say that. Is, is, Ra- some, are you is, saying, is someone is saying something? What was he saying? I don't know. I, I was trying to I was work saying, out. It's not. I thought he was saying it's oh, not. Oh, right. Because I could, <laughs> I could hear what you were saying over the sound of me. Shush. I've got a 50 50 chance of being right. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Now, axions were first proposed 40 years ago to explain why some reactions violate symmetry laws in particle physics, but they've since remained elusive. And it turns out that the answer wasn't to be found in some exotic phenomena in space, but here on the Earth, with exotic crystalline condensed matter materials. Now, the axion particle wasn't detected directly but it was found due to the vibrations exhibited by the material, which were exactly what you would see if axions were passing through it. So mm. although an axion particle wasn't seen directly itself, this is a huge leap forward in the field because essentially we found the footsteps and now it's time to find the Yeti. Although that's an interesting mm. analogy because there are no Yetis. So. Yeah, well, this is the thing. Maybe Ralph is right. That's really exciting. That's really exciting. Mm. I, I, I do feel we are on. We, I just there's there's been a lot of stuff out recently about kind of dark matter and where it's going, and you do feel it's the answer's not far around the corner. They're like, yeah, just sort of like fingertips, right? Yeah, I feel yeah. like people are sort of starting to stroke at the edges of it, and they're like, "Oh, what's yeah, this then?" Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you feel like the the picture starting. Whereas a few years ago, we talked about it on this show, it, it felt like it, it was a lot of, I don't say guesswork, but it was just like, ah, we kind of know something's there, maybe blah blah blah. Now it feels like there's a bit more concrete. That's cool. Okay, so moving from astronomy and cosmology into space exploration, Paul, what have you got for us? Right then, uh, time for a bit of space travel goodness. I- I'm going to leave Artemis alone for this month, mm. as we were very moon landing heavy last month. We were, um, we were. And have a look at what else we have to delight our deep and slightly creepy spaceship fetish. <laughs> so, first up, let's start with another SpaceX explosion. Way hey, 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 Elon. Oh, oh, no oh one. man, now, did you see it? Oh, God. Well, we were accused on Twitter the other day of being pathological haters of SpaceX, which really isn't true. No, it's not true at all. No, we dislike everybody equally. Um, <laughs> SpaceX just... Ha- this is true, we hate everyone. Uh, SpaceX just happens to be providing us with the best material of late. Yeah, we're, um, we're just balanced. Yeah, exactly. Um, probably because they're doing so much and pushing so many boundaries so quickly, which is, of course, admirable. But I'm afraid it's another rapid disassembly event for another SpaceX mm-hmm. spacecraft. Um, <laughs> this time it was Starship One. Um, that we all saw yep. the front the uh, the front fall off. Um, I mean, I think fall off is um, putting it kindly. Yeah, there, yeah. there's a, there's a joke in there about the the front fell off. Um, if you haven't seen the footage of this, then it is worth tracking down because it is pr- a pretty spectacular failure. Um, they were running a maximum pressure cryogenic pressure test at the time, so I guess they found the upper limit, which was the point <laughs> where, <laughs> which is the point where the upper bulkhead <laughs> yeeted itself into the air for. A, such a long while it doesn't appear to return when you're watching the video um, reached orbit then yeah it now seems it, it, it now seems that SpaceX had already decided to move on to and concentrate on the Mark 3 design uh, which would be far more advanced and build all the work they've done so far rather than repairing the Mark 1 so this is going to be retired um, so comments from Musk et al suggesting that this isn't a setback um, you know that that's suggesting they they they'd move, but it's interesting. The decision not to fly the Mark One as planned seems to have coincided with the moment just after its upper bulkhead was exploring the lower atmosphere. Um, in well, any part case, part of it flew. Yeah, in any case, as was pointed out by many wags on social media, the bulkhead has flown higher than NASA's SLS thus far, significantly higher. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, it's a great bit of footage. When it goes, it really goes. Um. <laughs> Anyway, um, next up, Venus, the goddess of love, the muse of Alexandros, second brightest celestial object, and now the focus of the attention of NASA, who've put out a list of 11 possible flagship missions for future funding, and amongst them is the return to Venus. And this would be the first American return to Venus since the Magellan Orbiter um, that radar mapped the surface between 1990 and 94. Mm. Of course, ESA and JAXA have 
been you know been to Earth's odd twin since, uh, and further back, the Soviet Union could pretty much lay claim to ownership <laughs> of Venus by the number of missions they launched. But this would be something else. Uh, this would be get this a large orbiter with two small orbiters, two short life landers, and one long life lander. Hang on. Yeah. A long life lander. Well. Of course. On Venus. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so this is, this is pretty exciting stuff. It appears to be planning one of the most detailed studies of the planet ever. Especially exciting if this long life lander can actually exceed the 127 mm. minute survival record of Venera 13 in 1981. So you think modern cameras, latest instruments, surface of Venus for days rather than a couple of hours. Mm. That's quite exciting. That, it that's is, actually, yeah. Yeah. Then people have got excited about that. Oh, wouldn't it... Wouldn't it be exciting because there are loads of volcanoes and st- are there loads of volcanoes on Venus? Possibly. This is what we get. You see, the thing is, Venus, closest planet, when it when it is closest, um I don't know, it's the stupidest thing to say, but it is it, it's it's the one that gets the closest. It's our you know, most like Earth in, in many respects. And yet yeah. we've not really We know so ex- little. Yes, exactly. It, it's a it's it's an enigma. So this is a really exciting mission. Because wouldn't it be amazing to sort of have real-time footage of sort of seeing, mm. like, smoke billowing or oh, something? Exactly. We have a few stills of the of the surface that are not that great. Nah, From I a want a cr- GIF. Yeah, the, exactly, exactly. This, this is this is two thousand. It's, it's 2019. We need to move on. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a really exciting mission if they fund it. Um, mm. Other missions on the list include uh, a new Mars orbiter, for resources, ices, and environments, or Mori. <laughs> <sighs> Shoot me now. Um, mm. A mission to Ceres. A Mercury lander. Mm. Get that one. A Pluto orbiter and KBO mission. Another more Mars orbiter to look at the atmosphere called Mosaic. I'm not even going to say what the uh, acronym is because it hurts. Me. <laughs> um, an astrobiology mission to Enceladus. Ooh. As well as others looking Ooh. at, I know, I know, lunar geology, Ooh. solar system history, and perhaps the most exciting of all the others, a Neptune Triton mission. Mm. Oh my gosh, how are they going to choose? Oh well, exactly, exactly well, between these. I think Artemis will. I think because there's a big push to go out to Mars after the Moon, that they'll end up doing the the Mars one. Yeah, or yeah. The, the the surface Mars one. I have a feeling, though, the Venus one is, is the one that everyone's got excited about. And I have a feeling the, the Venus one... I don't think they, they're not going to just fund one. They're going to fund some of these. Oh, OK. I don't so, know, though, Enceladus. They're Enceladus not fund all... and Neptune, Triton. Those yeah, they're not the going to fund all of them. Out. A Mercury land would be awesome. Yeah. I mean, that, that, so, yeah, there's, there's lots of the Neptune, Triton mission. The thing is, this is all the future. This is all... You know, don't get too excited. Um, some of you are going to be dead by the time these get launched. Yeah. Um, Aren't you cheerful? Yeah, you know mm-hmm. this is this is we you know it's, it's twenty twenty in in a few days. We're talking about missions that are at least in the twenty thirties. Yeah, and if you're talking about a mission to Neptune, Christ, you know that's going to take years. So you know mm. we're, we're talking about stuff that's going to happen in the twenty forties. And so, as we know, the the twenty thirties are twelve years away, not just eleven like the rest of us <laughs> think. Well, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you got more time. Um, and uh, of course, that's if we survive the Thunderdome of the coming decades. So, yeah. <laughs> the Thunderdome, um, Hunger Games. <laughs> okay, my next item is is breaking news. Really, as we record this, so details are still filtering out. But the European Space Agency has just completed its council meeting at the ministerial level. Um, of course, that's all the, the sort of space ministers and science ministers of the various European countries. Um, and it's spectacular news, frankly. The European governments um, have agreed ESA's largest budget ever. Uh, first budget increase uh, in, in 25 years and the biggest budget they've ever had. In fact, it would seem from the reports that the budget was oversubscribed and they actually got even more than they asked for, which, frankly, in the world of science is pretty darn unusual. Mm. Now, mm. we'll follow this up in the new year when we have more detail because this really is just, just coming out now. But the, the headline-grabbing statements so far are that the LISA, mm. remember there was part of the LISA Pathfinder recently that worked very well, so this is LISA, um, the satellite constellation to look for gravitational waves and the Athena mission for looking for black holes will both be fully Ooh. funded. Yep, the most sensitive, gravy-wavy instrument and a black hole mission in space at the same time. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, there's funding for the ISS until 2030, funding for transportation habitation modules for Gateway, 
All of the current ESA astronauts will get a second mission, so that includes Britain's Tim Peake. Um, funding has been agreed to recruit the next batch of ESA astronauts, so yeah, if you fancy a, fancy a, a change of career, then ESA are going to be recruiting soon. Um, it's been agreed that the European astronauts will go to the moon. Oh, uh, that's, that's pretty exciting. It's not just going to be the Americans. Um, and there's funding for a Mars sample return mission led by France, Italy and the UK, with the UK building mini rovers to potentially collect the samples that NASA's 2020 rover is going to leave for collection. Um, funding for 5G network satellites for Europe, um, that's a European Union initiative. Uh, more funding for the Copernicus Earth Observation, of course another European Union um, thing. More for the navigation, uh, the Galileo system, of course another European Union system, but more money for it. More, more for Ariane 6, more for the Vega Sea launchers. Um, a green light for ESA's reusable space rider spacecraft, that's very exciting. Uh, and perhaps most exciting, funding for the HERA mission which will explore um, and trial asteroid defence techniques. There is lots to unpick here, there's, there's lots more in this budget um, and we will we'll follow that up in the new year, but that that's the biggest budget ever. It looks like Europe is on the up in terms of space. Oh, wow. Mm. So, uh, last quick roundup of some of the other stories. India has confirmed that its moon lander, uh, Chandrayaan-2 Vikram, did indeed crash and it appears it was a failure of the braking rockets. But it hopes to have another crack with Chandrayaan-3 next year. Yay. UK space is moving along with UK launches. Designs for the vertical launch site in Sutherland, Scotland have been revealed and more money has been invested in Nuki Airport in Cornwall to bring about its conversion to a horizontal launch site, initially using Virgin Orbital. Starlink, the constellation grows, so does astronomers' ire. The latest images from observatories make for difficult viewing, but I wasn't going to get into it. Um, mm-hmm. China might have to face its downrange issues. that um, They've been growing of late um, as a spent booster fell on a town, setting fire to a building oh, and venting shit. toxic fuel into the air. On the other <gasps> hand, it's China, so they'll probably just re-educate the town into accepting that it didn't happen. Uh, a company called Nanorox, who run experiments on the ISS, want to launch experiments on mini space stations that utilise spent rocket sections. First mission will be with SpaceX next year. Hmm. And lastly, Rocket Lab, they of the Kiwi Space Programme, will take a pop at reusability in their next launch, bringing the booster back to Earth with the aid of a parachute. And now it's time for the Sky Guide, as the long dark nights make this the best month for amateur astronomers. Get a scope set up around 4pm and you're cooled and collimated by 5 with more than 12 hours of observing if you choose. Woo-hoo! The air's cold and still in December with the best possible conditions for observing or imaging at a reasonable hour. So, Jen, what have you got for us? Planets-wise this month, we're still high and dry on the old favourites Jupiter and Saturn. Mm. However, Mars is beginning to make more of an appearance, even mm-hmm. if it is still an early morning object. You'll need a clear horizon for on the morning of the 23rd of the month, around half past seven in the morning, and uh, only a 10 degree elevation, the red planet will appear very close to the crescent moon in the sky, which is a great marker for someone who's new to the hobby and perhaps hasn't seen Mars before. Hmm. Venus is visible low in the evening sky uh, in the southwest, and it gets easier to view as the month goes on. And on the 15th, Venus will be just one degree south of Pluto, which gives you a great chance to spot the dwarf planet if you've never seen it before. Um, Obviously, it's going to be tricky in the twilight sky um, and because the planets are low on the horizon, but it's worth a shot, right? If you're going to be looking at Venus anyway, you may as well try. Um, Obviously, take care. Don't point a telescope directly at the sun. Um, Uranus is actually probably your best bet of the month um, in terms of the planets Um, it's on the edge of naked eye visibility at magnitude 5.7 of course you'll need dark skies to be able to see it with the naked eye uh, but binoculars or a small telescope should suit you well and this month Uranus is making roughly a right angle triangle with Xi-Wen set in Cetus and Omicron Pisces with Uranus at the right angled vertex. If that makes any sense to anyone. None whatsoever. Get out a, get out a map, <laughs> find those two stars, draw a right angle, that's where you'll find Uranus. It was the easiest way that I could figure out to point 
Surely Uranus like... must be brighter than Xi One Set or um, um, Omicron Pisces. Surely. Maybe, but then if you've got a go to like me, you don't have to worry about any of this. <laughs> yeah. You just go Uranus. <laughs> get a go to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah in conclusion go and get a go-to <laughs> uh uranus um, is pointing towards aries uh look out for a pale blue disc and that's how you'll know you've spotted uranus instead of just another star yeah. so finally particularly if you're in the southern hemisphere you might like to try spotting the second interstellar interloper <gasps> to our solar system yes i know comet 2i borisov it reaches perihelion on the 8th and its closest approach to Earth is on the 28th. So this month is your best chance to see it. Um, it's going to be in the constellation Crater. And it'll be magnitude 16.3. Mm. So you'll definitely need a <laughs> Very large telescope. <laughs> reasonably large to very large it's telescope. Practically to a binocular target. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah, binocular it's... Uh, if you're not, it's those, it's across. those, yeah, it's uh, it's there for those who have big beasties of a telescope or are prepared to try and image it. Um, and because of that, I'm not really going to go into any details about exactly <laughs> where it is on the sky because it is going to be out of range for most of, our, most of our listeners. Uh, but for more information on the location of Borisov, uh, check out theskylive.com forward slash c 2019 q4 hyphen info and all of that is lowercase or if you're on apple check out the sky guide app uh, because they have the path of borisov encoded into into their night sky app yeah so that is really exciting as well i mean uh why would you mention the sky guide app <laughs> why would i mention the sky guide app maybe it's because i'm writing articles for them <laughs> so yeah you can if you like uh listening to me babylon you can also read some more of my stuff on the app <laughs> i think that is an absolutely fantastic thing to be pointing out in the sky guide because there has only been two opportunities for people to actually see something that has entered the solar system because we've only had notice of it twice i mean it might have happened a lot more yeah. in the past but this is only the second time we've noticed it and you can with amateur equipment if you're mm. a really keen star hopper actually see an object that has come from another star system that's yeah. phenomenal Isn't it, yeah because um Umama was on its Umama. way out of the solar system when we discovered it so it was only ever getting fainter Whereas we found Borisov when it was on its way into yes. the solar system. And so, yeah, it, it's great that people have been able to sort of track it, really accurately figure out its orbit. And um, and now, yeah, you, you genuinely have, I mean, yes, it's magnitude 16, or it will be magnitude 16, um, providing it, you know, continues to outgas and everything in the way that it has been so far. Um, and it is faint, but it is not completely impossible. And I think that is really exciting. Certainly not for the images. And I'm definitely going to have a stab at that. So, Paul, what have you got for us? So, being December, it's, of course, time for the best meteor shower of the year. But the Perseids are in August, I hear you cry. Well, you're wrong. The best shower of the year with a ZHR of 120 to 160 happens above your head while you're smooshing your ass on the office <laughs> photocopier after gorging mince pies and cheap blonk at the company <laughs> Christmas do. Peaking on the 14th is the Geminids, the shower that is a result of the Rock Comet or Pathon 3002. Slow moving, long lasting trails, and a ZHR that appears to be on the increase over recent, recent years mm. is actually the highlight of the meteor year. Of course, it gets ignored because everyone is drunk, too cold, or it's too <laughs> clouded out. But should you find yourself in a good enough state to grab a view, then do. It won't be a vintage year as the moon's 91% illuminated, it's just past mm. uh, full. So many of the smaller trails will be blotted out, but with the kind of long, slow, bright meteors you get with the Geminids, combined with a high strike rate, this is still worth tuning in for. Mm, definitely. Okay, so moving on to the deep sky, we've got the darkest nights away from the moon glare during the third quarter of the month, and my favourite treasures on view in the winter months. So Jen, what have you got for us in December? Oh, it's the winter sky, <laughs> and there are so many choices. Um... But this month, I'm actually going to go for something that was mentioned earlier on in the show. Mm. Um, and it is a real jewel of the winter sky, and that is the Pleiades. And this open star cluster has something to offer everyone. 
It's naked eye visible. It really wows through a small telescope, but it truly comes to life when you image it. Mm. So it's it's a great all rounder for everyone, uh, especially anyone you know. You're buying them a telescope for Christmas. You want to show them something. Get them on M forty five. So. Otherwise known as the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades look almost like a mini Big Dipper or plough, whatever you want to call it, in the sky, um, high up in the constellation of Taurus. And if they appear a bit fuzzy to you, your eyes aren't playing tricks, the star cluster plays host to a reflection nebula, which is a cloud of gas and dust um, in the interstellar medium that the hot young bright stars are illuminating as they sort of trundle their way around the galaxy. For a long time, it was thought that this might have been gas and dust left over from their formation, but we now think that it's just an intervening gas and dust cloud. So if you aren't sure where the Pleiades are in the sky, the constellation of Orion can help you. You can draw a line through Betelgeuse, the red giant mark in the top left shoulder of Orion, and Mysa, uh, which is at the head of Orion, and then trace this line across the sky until you get to the bright star Aldebaran, the bullseye. Uh, then trace this line further around the same distance between Mysa and Aldebaran again, and you'll land on the Pleiades. You can also use the stars in the belt of Orion and trace a line through to Aldebaran and beyond. The Pleiades will sit just below this line. Okay, so top of the Pleiades, Paul, what have you got? Right, my deep sky target this month is one of my easy favourites, but a really beautiful open cluster in Gemini, Messier 35. Mm -hmm. It's an easy find, uh, and a sweep of binoculars or a finder scope will find it easily, just a degree from one Geminorum. So numbered by Flamsted, who numbered stars in constellations west to east. So a good clue as to where to find this one. Uh, you shouldn't miss M35. It's the size of the full moon. It's magnitude 5.1, so it's one of those Messier visible with a naked eye with a good sky and some averted vision. It's 3,870 light years away, has at least 300 members, potentially thousands, and it's about 176 million years old and 11 light years across. Just nearby, hmm. you'll also see the globular lookalike NGC 2158. For a while, it was listed as such. Um, then it was realised it's an ancient open cluster, 9,000 years further than M35. Um, in fact, it's thought to be about 2 billion years old, which in open cluster terms is very old. Yeah. Look a little further beyond 2158 and you can see cluster IC2157, which is the faintest and least impressive, but with a nice wide field view, you can grab three clusters at once, a good imaging opportunity. Mm. To finish, we have the moon this month, which begins with first quarter on the 4th, full on the 12th, the last quarter on the 19th, new on Boxing Day on the 26th. Clear skies and happy hunting. Okay, so the results of the debate we ran over most of 2019 are in. Mm. In May, we put it to you to give us a list of the best space missions of all time. In June, we took the 10 that had the most votes and began whittling them down with a fiercely fought debate each month, which brings us to the point where we have a winner from the final five. <gasps> the final five. Yes. The five were Apollo 11, Hubble, New Horizons, Pioneer 11 and 12 as a single option, and Voyager. All NASA-led missions, which uh, it's been pointed out on Twitter, but uh, we put the vote to you and also the selections initially to you, so if there's a, an American bias in there, that's just because there's an American bias in the listenership and, and Europe and the rest of the world outside America. You just need to up your game and get more involved if you want to uh, take that bias out of there. So don't blame us listeners outside America. You makes your vote, you gets your choice. <laughs> so we've had a long soak vote for the last month, and we have your winner. It was not in doubt, really, was it? I don't think it was. And no. it was Voyager. I mean. Yeah. Which I don't think uh, anyone's surprised about. And no. I don't think anyone <laughs> can really argue with that either, can they? I, I had a sneaking suspicion Apollo 11 might, might nip mm. it. Because it's, it's yeah, the 50th. Yeah, I wondered... Yeah, exactly, because of the anniversary, I was like, oh, there's been so much yeah. Apollo stuff this year, yeah. is that going to put it over the edge? And for a while, they were very much neck and neck, it was, you know, only mm -hmm. a couple of votes between them, but then, yeah, Voyager just took off and... And I thought I thought Hubble had an outside, it was like, that was the stalking horse. Nah. And then, yeah. but the others, the others, they just, nah, wasn't, wasn't... 
the other two they they would never in fact on twitter to make the the vote work i had to put you have to put a, there's not enough spaces for five oh. so so i had to put a uh, sort of yes no vote on each one that's why you did that got gotcha. i had yeah i had to do it like that because you can't put five on one one vote and so it gave people a cheeky like no not this one i hate this one it just just made it more amusing <laughs> and actually um for for a good while uh, New Horizons actually had more no votes <laughs> than, than actual votes, um, and in fact, I think it, it. I don't know if it ended like that. I'm just. I'm just going to go and have a quick look. Actually, I didn't. I didn't check in the end. Um, I was just disappointed that the pioneers didn't do better because I thought I did a really good job of did. selling that. And I and I, as I was I, researching it, I was so impressed with pioneers, and I, I, um, I didn't vote myself, obviously, but. Um, but I, I, I was really rooting for pioneers. I was completely sold on 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 those and on on pioneer when you did that. That was they were they were great. Uh, where are we? Hang on, I'm just going to get to the. Yeah, no. In fact, pioneer and New Horizons ended with more no votes. Oh, oh no. Than actual votes for. Oh no. Oh. Um, and then, yeah. Hub, uh, Hubble, Hubble didn't do too bad, and then Voyager just just blew them out of the water. It had uh, it was eighty five percent vote in favour of. So if you're disappointed in that and you didn't vote in it, well, tough. Yeah, but yeah, Voyager, Voyager was. So I'd like to claim the victory there because I think I did. I argue Voyager. I think you did. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to claim victory there. Yeah, so you won. I'm, I'm going to take all the credit that Voyager should be going to Voyager. I'm going to take for myself. Yeah, well done, Paul. You you should go and thrash yourself off in victory. <laughs> I, I will. I will. The time has come to say goodbye to our friends for 2019, a whole month that concludes the year and the decade. <laughs> the show is over. The content has dried up. And Paul's got to stuff his monkey back into its suitcase, and the monkey doesn't even get paid. Just, just spanked, spanked so hard it'll make you blind. <laughs> if you like the show, send us an email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. If you're on social media, come and say hi. If you don't like it, piss off and say nothing. We don't care. And I guess it's that time of year where we're probably ready to start revamping the show. Hmm. Mm. So I guess we'll talk about this properly in the new year, but get the cogs turning, start thinking about what you like, what you don't like, what you miss that we got rid of from before, what you want shortened, what you want lengthened, and yeah, we'll talk about it next year. So until our festive newton must special episode rammed hard into your stocking on Christmas Day, it's goodbye from Sidonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>